I am Amanda Scott and I'm representing Bristol Community College Student Veterans of America. I am interviewing Bill Womack on April 4th, 2024 at the Fall River Community Media Studio at Bristol Community College in Fall River, Massachusetts. Also present with us is Stephen Rice, who is operating the camera, and Denny Cosmo of the Joseph A. Marshall Veterans Center. This interview is being conducted for the Veterans History Project at the Library of Congress. Uh, Bill, I don't know where you'd like to begin your story at. Um, well, let's start with Bessemer, Alabama. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Everybody's asked that. Uh, how did I get from Bessemer to here, which is kind of around the block to get across the street sort of thing. But mm -hmm. uh, You've come a long way. Well, <laughs> my uh, grandmother on my mother's side was raised in Middleborough, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. She went to Emerson, graduated in 1910, took a teaching job in Nashville as a single female, and was married and then had children, my mother being one. And then my mother married and her husband was working out of Birmingham which put us at Bessemer, and that's where I was born. Mm -hmm. But as, but cause of that, my great grandfather had built a cottage down in Onset, Mass, Onset Island. Mm -hmm. So my grandmother brought her kids up here, and my mother brought her kids up here, which I was one of, and I brought my kids up here. So that got us to Onset through our early life, and then after the service, I was in construction heavy. Mm -hmm. Civil highway construction, working for different contractors, ended up with Perini Corporation mm -hmm. out of Framingham, Mass. in 1990, and I've been here ever since. So you get a southern boy out of the sticks of Alabama to Massachusetts, it's a long trip. The, absolutely. So, so here we are. Yep, here we are. Yeah. What um, made you join the service? <laughs> hey, he, you know, people ask that, but the, the young people your age don't know what the draft is about. In the 50s, 60s, 70s, it was all about the draft. Mm -hmm. So everybody had a number or a classification, and you were going for two years mm -hmm. minimum, four years maybe. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the draft was on. Vietnam was hot. So you either got drafted into the infantry with mm -hmm. the Army or you joined. So we joined the Navy. You now, you want to hear that story. I'm a engineering, civil engineering student at Georgia Tech. Mm -hmm. I'm co-oping. You know what co-op is? I do not. You work a quarter, you go to school a quarter. Okay. You come back to school and you go back to work. And it's the idea is you work your way through school. Mm-hmm. And you're working with company or in a field that you're studying, which was civil engineering. So <clears throat> in my fifth year, because I didn't register or go through registration at Tech, mm -hmm. they did not send a student classification in to my draft board, which was in Nashville, mm -hmm. Tennessee. So when the draft board did not get that student classification they immediately put me up as 1A mm -hmm. and 1A was top of the list okay you were you were going to you were out the door mm -hmm. so when I got the notice from the draft board in fact I was working on a bridge in Miami Florida mm -hmm. <laughs> having a good time mm -hmm. but uh, I had to get back to the draft board or, or you know I either had to join or I was going to be drafted. Mm -hmm. So I called the draft board and I said, well, I'm 1A, where am I on the list? And he said, son, you're not only on the top of the list, you're next. Oh. Because you've been student deferred for four years. And I said, yeah, but I'm still a student. Doesn't matter. You're now 1A and mm -hmm. you're on top of the list. And if you're not down here, you know, whatever they said, I had seven How days. old were you? 22. 22? Yeah. Okay. And, uh, because I'd been in school for four years mm -hmm. and trying to become an, quote, engineer. Yeah. Uh, 
So, I went back. I was in Miami, like I said, working on a bridge. I went back home, which was Nashville at the time. That's where my folks were living. Mm -hmm. And my dad says, get down to the recruiter's office and get in the Navy because you do not want to go to Vietnam. 500,000 troops in Vietnam at that time. Mm -hmm. 50,000 of them were doing the fighting. And, you know, it was, you know, it was held bent for leather and said, you do not want to do that to your mother. Yeah. So go down and get in the Navy, right? So I go down to the recruiting office. Now, in those days, they were all in a post office. So you had the Navy, the Coast Guard, the Army, the Marine Corps, the Air Force, and they were just lined up. Mm -hmm. So I go into the Navy recruiter, and, and uh, he says, well, I'll take your name, but I got a six-month waiting list. Mm -hmm. All right, so I said, well, I'll go over here and get in the Coast Guard. I went over to the Coast Guard. Mm -hmm. Guy said, we'd like to have you, but he said, I got an 18 months waiting list. Oh, wow. Well, I didn't want to go in an Air Force. No offense to anybody. <laughs> and I was already going to go in the Army. If mm -hmm. I didn't do anything, I was drafted into the Army, so yeah. I stepped into the Marine Corps office. And, the, and that gunny sergeant in there said, man, I'll sign right here. I'll take you right now. I says, oh, yeah. And he says, and he says, let's talk a little bit. So we, you know, I was football and gymnastics and scuba diving, you know, all the things young men do. Mm -hmm. And that Marine recruiter looked at all of that. And he said, I got the special thing for you. I said, oh, yeah, what's that? And he said, it's called LERPS, Long Range Recon and a special training you can swim you can mm -hmm. go off mountain tops you know you can jump out of airplanes and man like this is so i said man that's for me you know? yeah so i said let me think about it so i go home so dad comes in from work we're sitting around the table he said well, how'd you make out i said i think i'm gonna join the marine corps well <laughs> He went ballistic. Mm -hmm. I can only you know, imagine. <laughs> yeah, 50,000 troops over in Vietnam doing mm -hmm. all the fighting and saw the Marine Corps. He says, why do you want to do that to your mother? I said, I never thought about my mother. You know, I'm mm -hmm. just thinking about where I'm headed. So, well, let's sleep on it. Well, the next morning, in the kitchen, like 7.30, Dad's getting ready to go to work. Phone rings. Dad answers, it's for me. It's the Navy recruiter. He says... Your Joe College, all of that kind of stuff. Yeah. He said, I got a guy this morning that's called up said he's not coming in. He said, so I'm going to move you to the top of the list. He said, but you got to be here by 8 o'clock. Mm -hmm. My dad says, excuse my friends, but don't let the door hit you in the ass, son. He <laughs> said, you get down there right now and sign up. Yep. So I went down and signed up for the Navy. That's how I got in the Navy. Mm -hmm. Now, if you want to take that story a little bit further. Let's do it. Well, it came back. We came in for induction. We're mm -hmm. standing in the induction line, and, and there's 50 guys standing there, everybody in their boxer shorts and doing the physical. And this Marine DI comes down through there, and he's pulling out about every third or fourth guy. Boom, mm -hmm. boom. Pulled one over here on my right, pulled one over here on my left, and kept going. And when he got done, he said, now all you guys are in the Marine Corps. So you think about that now. Mm -hmm. That's number two that... One, I was going to join. Two, mm -hmm. the DI went on both sides, missed yep. me again, right? So now we go to boot camp in San Diego, and they go through classification with the Navy, which you probably know how all that mm -hmm. goes. And I wanted to be a quartermaster. Okay. Because, you know, I like boats. So I wanted to be on the water, and a quartermaster mm -hmm. was to working on the bridge and navigating and and that kind of thing and and they said well I'll, you don't have 2020 uncorrected vision what's your second choice when i want to be a gunner's mate well that's a school is in the great lakes mm -hmm. a little southern boy didn't want to go up where it was snowing <laughs> yep so what's your third choice a bosun's mate well my company commander had a running fit because he said that's the scum of the earth they chip and paint all the time i said yep but when the captain and the exec get killed, the, boatswain, the chief boatswain mate takes over the ship because mm -hmm. he knows more about the ship than anybody's seamanship. Yep. And I said, because I want to learn seamanship. So, and, you know, they just, they got all upset with that, the company commander. They put me back in reclassification, start talking about my education and my co-op work, which was building bridges and, mm -hmm. and highways and, you know, construction. 
they took all that down and threw me back out. Come graduation day, I had no orders. I had to wait two weeks. Got a set of orders to MCB 11. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you ask people, what kind of ship is an MCB? <laughs> huh? Do you know? No. It, well, what about a DDG? That's a destroyer, right? A CVS, what, a carrier? carrier mm -hmm. You know, and LSTs, PT boats. What's an MCB? Nobody knew. Mm -hmm. And I ran across one guy at the club. He said, oh, he said, that's the mobilized construction battalion. Those are the CBs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What number? I said, 11. He said, son, those guys are in Da Nang. Your ass is, mm -hmm. you're on the way to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Just like that. So now I've been around the block to get across the street. I'm now in the Navy. I'm now in the CBs. And I'm supposed to be headed for Vietnam. Well, we found out the battalion, when I got to Port Wanimi, the battalion was coming on. Mm -hmm. So I got to looking around there, and there's these 12 men teams had popped up in the morning and they were hoorahing and carrying telephone poles and all kind of stuff and I said who are those guys and they said that's a CB team oh yeah I said what do they do they said well that's all volunteer duty 12 guys airliftable anywhere in the world 24 hours and I said what do you get for that you get to go to the head of the child hall you know the head of the line at the <laughs> child hall so that's for me mm -hmm. so I inquired, and they were taking volunteers for the next team at that particular time. So I put my name on a the list. There were 120 guys volunteered for that next team, mm -hmm. and I was selected as one of the 12. And so now we head for Vietnam. We land in the DMZ, and guess who I'm hooked up with? Third Marines. <laughs> So I went all the way around the block, you know, mm -hmm. three times, dodged the Marine Corps twice, and ended up serving with the Marines mm -hmm. for the whole time we were up on the DMZ. Couldn't get rid of them. <laughs> no. Well, it was it was kind of a fate thing, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, as that as we progressed, if it wasn't for some of those guys, I wouldn't be here talking about this today because you know they saved our bacon more than once. And uh, even though we were in the hole with them, they were still the, the guy, you mm -hmm. know. So, and I got several fraternity brothers that flew choppers in, in Vietnam with 3rd Marine, uh, Marine Air Corps. So have a lot of closeness and in, in relationships with the Marines, even yeah. though I was wearing a CB uniform. So, so that's, and that's my long story about how I got in the Navy. <laughs> It ended up in Vietnam, and to this day, I don't, my, you know, my dad knew that we were where I was headed, mm -hmm. and, and he, you know, and, and we went in with the team, you know, we were cross-trained in, in uh, all the weaponry. In fact, I spent a month at Camp Pendleton with the Marines doing squad tactics, mm -hmm. uh, weapons training, uh, went to escape and evasion school, Coronado with the Navy SEALs. Uh, went to Vietnamese language school down in Coronado. So all of that, we knew exactly where we were headed. And, you know, of course, my dad knew, but my mom never did know. Because mm -hmm. he said, not never telling told her, her? You're, you're in the Navy, Bill. Mm -hmm. you, you tell her you're in the Navy, you know. You're not in the CBs. You're not in Vietnam. You don't, right. don't tell anybody that. Mm -hmm. So I think did she, she end up ever finding out? I think she probably did after yeah. we got home, you know, mm -hmm. and it was all over with. But, yeah. Uh, uh, anyway, my dad was real protective of my mom. He didn't want her worrying about me. And, and uh, of course, you know, I thought it was all for real at the time. So I wasn't really thinking about whether she was going to worry about me or not. Yeah. So anyway, that's how I got in the Navy. Very nice. Thank you for sharing that. Mm. Um, tell us a little bit about uh, what was the day-to-day -day life that while you were a CB, like, what what did that consist of? Um, was it always different? Was there you were always learning new things or building new things? And tell us a little bit. Well, it, 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 the, the, except for the Marshall Islands, I, I spent my whole time in in Vietnam. I was in there three times. Mm -hmm. uh, up on the DMZ, we and you know we stayed 
Northern I Corps. Vietnam was partitioned off in one, two, three, four mm -hmm. areas, and we say Northern I Corps. That's up on the DMZ, which was the 17th parallel. That was all military, and uh, so the major objective of going up there with the Seabees was to build combat bases and support for the Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. That was it. So everybody was working. Uh, I was on a detachment uh, out with uh, six other Seabees at Quaviet. So we were outside of the major Dong Ha combat base. So, you know, it's basically, you know, you you get up in the morning, you go to work, mm -hmm. and you work till you get through, and it might be four o'clock, and it might not be till the next day, mm -hmm. depending on what's going on. And, you know, there was UHC rations in those days. We didn't have MREs, but, and then they finally got a chow hall up, but then while we were in Quaviet, there was no chow hall and all of that, so you were kind of living in a combat zone yeah get up go to work you know stand your watch protect yourself at night and mm -hmm. come back the next day so it was living in a combat zone under combat conditions uh, the threat of mortar rocket attacks uh, land attacks all the time mm -hmm. so you kind of dealt with that so we kind of became an everyday way of life but became normal almost yeah, and it was, uh, you know, you, you had your guys around you and uh, the camaraderie of the team and, the, and the, you know, the conditions. Uh, it was just, you know, it was just your way of life. That's yeah. what you were doing. And the only thing you talked about was the land of the big PX where you could get a hamburger and a chocolate milkshake. And mm -hmm. that was, of course, trying to get home. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. So. Uh, what it, about the maintenance facility that you kind of discussed a little bit with us? Well, that yeah, we we got to jump ahead for that because the the team got we got picked up and and sent down into the Delta, mm -hmm. uh, not as military support but more as a military Peace Corps, working under the MACV uh, operations, which was a military assistance command. They did a lot of uh, SOG work down in the Delta and then we were down there beside those guys who so had some A-teams, Army A-teams and ourselves that were kind of, the A-teams were doing a lot of military training to the South Vietnamese and we were doing a lot of construction quote unquote uh, support for that. So that maintenance building we lived in the village in long Schwinn, mm -hmm. which was uh south west of saigon fairly close to the cambodian border so we were in the village with the vietnamese and that's why we went to language school mm -hmm. <laughs> we, we found out that they knew as much english as we did vietnamese so it worked out pretty good mm -hmm. So the, the maintenance building, uh, you know, our job was to kind of do some work that would improve the way of life of the South Vietnamese villagers. Uh, most of them were refugees that were either running from the north or came from the north to Cambodia and Cambodia back into South Vietnam had been run out of Saigon, run out of different villages, but then most of them were, you know, living off the American waste. Mm -hmm. and uh, on the side of the road or in a hut in the side of town. So the, the, the village chief had this maintenance building that was steel structure, been moved around for 20 years. It was actually brought into South Vietnam by the French and they wanted it put together. And of course it was all in pieces in the weeds and but uh, we sorted it out, put it together. So it, uh, it was a major project, but took a while took mm -hmm. almost eight months to put that thing together wow. yeah. and uh you know between all the other stuff that was going on so but uh yeah it, that, that was a good project but the the main thing you know up on the dmz 
was military. And you were always with military. And whether it be, you know, up there it was Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we had guys up at Quezon. We had guys at uh, LZ Nancy. I was at LZ Nancy, Quaviet. Quaviet got overrun, uh, but it was always military. You were with the Corps the whole time, mm -hmm. and you were doing military support. Down in the Delta was a different story. It was you were in the village with the South Vietnamese, and you found out real quick that the South Vietnamese did not care what was going on in Saigon. They didn't care what kind of government they had in Hanoi. They wanted one thing. They wanted the war to stop. Mm -hmm. They wanted to grow rice, take it to the market, trade it for whatever they needed, and go back home and raise their family, you know, and work in the rice paddies. And they had been going through this war thing since the French were in there back in the 50s. And then they start getting this aggression from the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese, and then the next thing you know, the U.S. is in there, and they just wanted it to stop. And they didn't care whether it was communism, democracy, or whatever, just let me grow my rice and take care of my family. Mm -hmm. We learned that being in the village with the people. So a little different concept than up on the DMZ where it was, you know, fight and kill or be killed. and. Mm -hmm. Because you didn't have any interaction with the Personal, Vietnamese yeah. except on the end of a gun barrel, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, so we learned that the the South Vietnamese were real people, and they had the same concerns that we did, you know, families and making a living, and you know, we're trying to get home, and they're trying to get us the hell out of there to boot. So mm -hmm. it was a whole different uh, concept. And the, the uh, and then uh, then we went back up to Quan Tri, and the third time and the third trip and then that was again all military. So and that was a little different ball game again. But the end of the day, the only thing that stuck was the guys you were with and people. Even, you know, even this 50 years later, they asked me about why the team, why were you, why did you even go there? And I said, well, if you take a 800-man battalion, take a company operation or even a platoon-sized operation where you got 70, 80 guys and, and mostly the grunt stuff was, you know, larger operations, mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you, half of those people didn't want to be there to start with. They were all drafted to be in there and they had, they were there just because. Mm -hmm. So they didn't have a whole hearted dedication to taking care of things. If you kind of get my drift and so, but with a team, everybody was on the same page all volunteered, all wanted to be there. We trained together, we slept together, we worked together. And it, I, I always use the analogy, it's like a football team. Mm -hmm. and when you come up to the line in a football play, everybody on the field knows what the play is. They know where the ball's going, they know everybody's got a job, so everybody does their job and you score, right? So with the team, you knew what the other guy was going to do. He knew what you were going to do. You had that uh, confidence mm -hmm. that that he had your back and you had his. You knew what the play was when you stepped out the door. So uh, I felt a lot safer with the smaller group than mm -hmm. I did working in a battalion, you know, organization with people around you that you didn't know. Mm -hmm. And, and you can say what you want to, but you've been on a ship, you don't know everybody on that ship. Definitely not. My brother was on an aircraft carrier, it had 6,000 people yeah. in it, and he didn't, you know, it. <laughs> Every day you see somebody new. <laughs> Literally, you'd be on a six-month deployment and. Yeah, 
and you still don't know everybody yet. but you know with our team you know we train together we we travel together mm -hmm. we work together we were in combat together uh so you develop that camaraderie with these people definitely and uh and then and you can count on them you know and uh so Thank you for sharing all of this, Bill. Hmm? Thank you for sharing all of this, Bill. The uh, I know it's tough. The the thing about Vietnam was the standard or the duty tour in Vietnam was a year. You went in, you stayed twelve months, came home, you were done, and unless you re up to go back, the CBs took you in for ten. Mm -hmm. brought you home then they look at your record and say well you hadn't been there a year you've only been 10 months like you go back again right so you do that second tour mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the comments about coming home from combat from war zones from living like that is the detox and you know the PTSD and can you come back to civilization in Vietnam, you got on a plane in Saigon or Da Nang or wherever, Cameron Bay, wherever you were coming out of, and in a short period of time, you were standing on the street in L.A. Mm -hmm. or San Francisco. You were, and within 24 hours, you were back in the U.S. of A. And the first time we came back, we got whacked in the middle of the night. You know, you were up in a firefight and you know mortar attack and all of that they came down you know we got clear daylight seven in the morning let's say nine thirty. they were at the hooch and at the tent grab your gear you're coming back and within 24 hours we're standing on the street and in, in uh, san francisco and travis air force base there was no unwind i mean we went from combat to travis in 24 hours mm -hmm. So to deal with that, the, the Vietnam vet had a hard time, a lot of hard time. And our American society didn't recognize that. They didn't recognize the Vietnam War as a whole. And you were considered a warmonger, a baby killer, and whatever else they put on you when you came home. So, um, so people ask, you know, and then of course, we turned around and went right back <laughs> and you know and so we just stayed because there was no life here and as long as we had to be in the service we stayed in Vietnam because mm -hmm. that's where it was and so the fortunate thing for us is when our team got we were signed up we in fact we were getting ready to make a fourth tour or second trip into the Delta and we got reassigned to go to the Marshall Islands mm -hmm. and I'll tell you about that in a minute but on Saturday mornings we were supposed to while we were in the Marshalls we were supposed to clean up the equipment and check the oil and you know grease the tires and all that and then take a half a day off and we had conics boxes you know what a conics box is you know those big metal containers you see them on container ships mm -hmm. Well, everything got shipped in these containers, or call them a conix box. And we'd go in there, and that's we used to be in the team, and with a case of beer or two, hard-boiled eggs, and we'd be in our shorts, and we'd close the door. It'd be 120 degrees in that box. Mm -hmm. Right. Hot. Drinking beer. You know, sweating like a mule. And then we'd start getting into each other and we fought in there we sat in there and cried mm -hmm. and we sat out there for six months off and on doing that and that's where we detoxed and if it hadn't been for that i don't know whether i would have ever made it back in the states so that was a uh, a godsend that we was able to stop off there for a few months and and get that out from under us mm -hmm. and the picture 
that I showed you of the team and, and the marshals that if you notice real carefully, I got a big white piece of gauze bandage on the side of my left eye here. Mm -hmm. As we'd been in a fist fight just before that and I just got sewed up and that was a result of, and that was one of the team members, mm -hmm. you know, so that was part of that detox thing that we were beating the crap out of each other and then we'd cry yeah. about it and then we'd go back and drink more beer. And so anyway. I just want to say when I was on the ship, the boys would do that in their birthing. They called it Salsa Sunday. <laughs> they'd come in Monday morning and they'd have black eyes or same thing. So they're yep. still doing that. <laughs> well, we, yeah, and we weren't doing that to be the fight club. Right. We, we would just, we got into difference of opinion mm -hmm. about what we were, what we had done in Vietnam, what kind of combat situations, what did we do here, why did we do this, and then it was just, you know, yeah. it just, and it, our answer to everything for the, you know, almost three years before that was you just locked up around and shot somebody, mm -hmm. you know. So we didn't have any live ammunition in the, in the marshals, so we just beat the crap out of each other. So, yeah. you know, just went to Fist City. But uh, anyway, that was good. And, and I, you know, we're, we're still working with, are, you, are we in trouble here? No, no, we're good. Huh? Keep going. <laughs> we're good. So, um, the, the four of the team members on that last team, and I, uh, well, myself included in that four, we're still together and we still do things. And uh, we have a Zoom, thanks to COVID, we have Zoom meetings now and about once every two months. That's so we're awesome. still in contact with each other. Are you guys all spread out or are you guys all in mass? One's in California. Oh, okay. In fact, he's still living outside the gate of the CB base out there. Uh, one guy's in San Antonio. Uh, one guy is between Florida and Connecticut. He's he says he's retired, so he spends six months in the winter time in Florida, mm -hmm. and he spends the other time in uh, Connecticut. That's so a big the, gig. <laughs> the, the surprising thing, and you know, even some of the guys that that I cross paths with in the battalion, uh, I'm still you know connected with a lot of those mm -hmm. guys. So I say a lot of them, four of them that I know of, but they. Uh, the the thing that that kind of stands out to me is everybody came home and mm -hmm. everybody got out with an honorable discharge and then everybody went into civilian life and were very successful i mean they didn't just go out here and grunt around and you know hoe potatoes they right. the guy in san antonio one of the most successful commercial or farm ranch real estate developers in the state of Texas. Really? Yeah, the guy was, and he put together a Vietnam memorial mm -hmm. in San Antonio. He campaigned for it, raised the money, had it done and it's now in the city square in San Antonio, and it's the largest bronze casted statue in the country with the exception of Iwo Jima, which is at Arlington. Mm -hmm. And it's at San Antonio, and it's taken from a scene at Quezon mm -hmm. with a Navy corpsman calling in a helicopter chopper to pick up a wounded comrade. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, so yeah, he was very instrumental in that. And then, you know, the, the, the other guys have done different walks of life, but nobody came home and went off a deep end. Mm -hmm. So- I'm sure having each other and going through it with each other definitely helped. Um, just having the support and knowing what you guys all went through. Yeah, and, and surprisingly enough, the, the, a lot of the support has only come up in the, you know, this contact and working together in the, probably in the last 10 years. Because once, you know, once we got out, you, you scattered like three seats to the wind. Mm -hmm. Everybody had their own place to go, but uh, but we eventually came back together for whatever reason, and here we are. Yeah. But the, the uh, you know, back into, the go back to, let's go back to 
military time in Vietnam, mm -hmm. the American government, uh, and, and no fault of theirs, but <laughs> they trained, they brainwashed us, they trained us how to kill people. Mm -hmm in the most sophisticated ways you can imagine with every kind of weapon you could think of. And and they put you in that jungle or put you in that environment and, and it's either kill or be killed or you survive to stay alive. And, and it was, we're doing it for the greater good. You know, we're fighting mm -hmm. communism. And when they brought you home, there was no detox, no nothing. You just went, boom, back out on the street. Mm -hmm. It, and then you spend some time in the village with the village with the Vietnamese, and you sit and eat rice with them, and you know talk about their family issues, and you know you building them a schoolhouse or something to educate their children. And then you get back here, and you know when I went in. You know, we, we, my generation came out of the Second World War and you were born and bred for the red, white, and blue. Mm -hmm. Democracy, we're gonna save the world. You know, we're, it's our duty. And to protect this country, it's still our duty. But we're out doing these, I won't call them police actions, because a lot of people thought that was a police action, but. Uh, you know, these military supports of these different things around the world. So you were 110% committed mm -hmm. to going into combat, in to put yourself in harm's way to protect democracy in throughout the world. We were taught that from kids. We were brainwashed that when we were in boot camp, when we were in training, mm -hmm. teach you how to do all that stuff. You go over in that environment, you live that, you live it, you live it, you live it, you come home. And then after you get home and you start thinking about it, it was about two years, maybe a little over two years before I realized that Vietnam was a total waste, absolute total waste. There was no reason for being over there the way we were, what mm -hmm. we were doing. And and because it didn't help the Vietnamese people at all in the end run, we left it. And there was times when the and the VC were smart. They would go into a village and they'd set a mortar tube up in a quote friendly village, pro American village, because the whole idea was to get the Vietnamese to believe in democracy and mm -hmm. to support democracy and fight for democracy. And, and the whole time they'd been running from North Vietnam to get out of communism or to get out of the dictatorship that they was experiencing. Mm -hmm. But so the VC would drop a, put a mortar tube in the middle of a friendly village, quote unquote, and they'd start dropping mortar rounds on the U.S., you know, in that case, usins. Mm -hmm. and, and so we had uh, dual 40s, which I don't know if you know what that is, but 40 millimeters, and they track mounted. And so, you know, you get trajectories and asthmas and, you know, fire missions and all of those things, you know, artillery type thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, you could see the motor flashes from when the tubes, when the boom, you know, and there, you could see it and you'd bore sight. You, you didn't have to try to lob around you could just look down the bore, open the breech and look, say, I got him. Put around in, close the breech up, boom, dead center shot, right? Mm -hmm. Call in for permission to fire, permission denied. Friendly village. So the VC was sitting there and all night and pound the crap out of us and nobody could shoot back. Mm -hmm. Political, yeah, very political. So, and, and that's the way the thing was run, mostly. And it took a while, you know, and I won't say it was all hundred percent was that way and a, and a lot of things were you know a lot of good came of a lot of it but we got 58,000 names on that wall down in Washington that say different so 58307 to be exact so 58,307 mm -hmm. 
So it took two years or so after they got back to say that it was all a waste. We should have never been there. And what the hell am I doing? Mm -hmm. You know, what did I do? But if you used to ask me right now, what did I go again? I would go again. Yeah. Yep. And uh, I sit around with a lot of old, old timers, Vietnam veterans, and they'll tell you the same thing. It was kind of an exercise in futility, and we were scared the crap out of us while we were there. But mm -hmm. when we got home, you know, we'd go back if we needed to go. Absolutely. If it was for the the USA, and the, you know, to protect our families and what we have here, we'd be there in a minute. Mm -hmm. But I don't know whether I'd be back in Vietnam for it or not, but yeah. we'd stand up. Well, let me ask you, um, how did your military career affect your um, your life after the military? <laughs> Besides beating the crap out of my first boss <laughs> after that? Yeah. <laughs> Of course, you know, we got home, went to work, you know, we were still hostile and uh, still am to some degree, mm -hmm. even at 80 years old. But uh, I, th I think uh, it gave you a lot deeper appreciation for life mm -hmm. and for the things that we have in this country mm -hmm. the way those people were living and of course in the war climate you know that wasn't helping things but it just it I think it's just a, it was a lot deeper appreciation for the fact that we had a place to sleep every night and a job and food and in the country that we live in and that and that it wasn't for free mm -hmm. so I think we had a lot more respect for that and and uh, just appreciation that you know I'm here to tell about it. You know it was, and then and then going forward from that, the the and I had some training in this when I was co-op and with some old timers mm -hmm. uh, that mentored me, and I was very fortunate. I had some good mentors along the way, but you treat the people the way you'd want to be treated. So after seeing the, the poverty, the abuse, the war-torn areas over there, then when you get back here and you go into civilian work and you're working with people, treat them like people, mm -hmm. treat them like individuals, equals, and, and then if you're working for them, fine, but if they're working for you, still fine, mm -hmm. you treat them that way, it's equals. And, uh, you'll get a lot further along. So I, I think it helped in uh, managing people because mm -hmm. was, I've was i been awful fortunate that I've, I've uh, worked myself into a pretty good position mm -hmm. over the years and, and uh, was able and worked a lot of people and was responsible for a lot of work. So, uh, so I think it set my attitude rather than being uh, you know, uh, hard nose, yell, scream, you know, kick ass and take name sort of thing. Like you would put, uh, with no offense to anybody, but mm -hmm. a Marine DI at boot camp, you yeah. know. Uh, you know, you get more bees with honey than you do with vinegar. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I didn't have to carry a weapon and, and uh, equalize things out. So I think it's made a difference that way. That, absolutely. I like that metaphor, by the way. What's that? The bees with honey. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so let's backtrack a little bit. Um, how about your family life while you were in? I know you joined when you were 22. Where did you have a girlfriend, a family when you were in? Did you get out? Tell us a little bit about that. Um, <laughs> did the being, you know, in the Navy get you some ladies? Uh, <laughs> uh, I just lost my wife a couple of years ago. But. I'm sorry to hear that. Really. Only share what you're willing no, to. No, 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 that's okay. That's just, I met my wife my freshman year in Georgia Tech, 1961. Mm -hmm. And 
we didn't get married until 1968. So that was seven years there of, you know, having a relationship. And she went one way, I went in the service, I went to Vietnam and the second run in the, the in Vietnam, the Delta, when we were down there, things were a little different, but I figured out that I better get home and marry that gal because if I don't do it now, I might not get another chance. So mm -hmm. I came home on a 30-day leave and got married in 68, and I went back to Quantry. So uh, that's how that started. And we were married for 40 something years she passed away a couple of years back so uh yeah so she was there for the last tour mm -hmm. and it's, it's funny <laughs> the one of the other guys the team guys was married and they, they the navy flew the teams in a priority flight we just weren't on a commercial flight they it, it was a v a VF 18 squadron or something mm -hmm. but anyway they were we were trying to get home and we got delayed in Saigon and one of the wives was upset that we weren't home when we were supposed to be so she calls the base commander and says well, I don't know where my husband is and he told her he said well they've been delayed they had to hold up they're picking up some seals, and she went ballistic on this base commander. He said, "You, my, my husband's been in Vietnam for all this time, and, and we're waiting for some seals, some damn seals, you know, like animals, you know." Yeah. <laughs> and she had no idea uh -huh. that we were, you know. And then in the Delta, uh, we integrated with mm -hmm. uh, the seals and the A teams, but. Uh, when she finally figured out that you know, and then of course that's what we this team came up and uh, we flew back together. But uh, so that was kind of funny that the wives were all seals. they wanted us to do was get home, and and she was worried about Navy seals mm -hmm. or seals that they just said seals. You yeah. Know? So yeah, and it, and that ended up where I got you know two daughters and four grandkids, two of the grandkids adopted. Mm -hmm. uh, so yes, yeah, and like I said, I've been blessed. Good Lord's blessed me mm -hmm. more than once. <laughs> Is everybody out here? Or are they? No. Uh, well, they all. <laughs> that was one reason how we got back to New England. Mm -hmm. they, we were in Atlanta. I was working for S.J. Groves. We mm -hmm. were building the freeway system in Atlanta. And the headhunters started coming around looking, recruiting, and my girls were both in high school getting ready to go to college. And I got a job offer from Perini Corporation mm -hmm. in Framingham. And they said, well, where is that? Because I had two or three other people looking. And I said, well, that's in outside of Boston. Well, that's where you're going to work, Dad, because we're going to school in Boston. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, because of the island, Onset Island. The kids have spent all their summers on Onset Island. Mm -hmm. They still spend all their summers and they're 50 some years old. Really? So, but, so they, that's what kind of controlled coming back to New England. That was mm -hmm. in 1990. And my, both the girls went to school in Boston. One went to Simmons and one went to Pine Manor. Okay. Uh, the oldest one went to Pine Manor. She married a local guy from Massachusetts, and he's an orthopedic surgeon uh, down here in South County, Rhode Island, puts knees and hips in people every day. Mm -hmm. uh, and they've adopted two kids, uh, one from Guatemala and one local. And the youngest daughter married an Italian from Rome, mm -hmm. full-blooded. Uh, she was working for Mattel, American Girl. Mm -hmm. You might know American Girl stores, think, yep. dolls. Mm -hmm. She was in Natick uh, Shoppers World, the American Girl store. Mm -hmm. She got transferred to Texas, Houston, about 12 years ago. Okay. So she's down there, two grandkids, one 
already graduated from Texas A&M. The other one was between Maritime here mm -hmm. and Texas. So okay. uh, that's the young man. We're trying to get him figured out where he's headed. Mm -hmm. But uh, So they're down in Texas. In fact, I just came off a 12-day, 4,000-mile road trip. Did you? How was yeah. that? Well, went to Texas and back, you know. <laughs> Yeah, a lot sure of, it was a good time. Yeah, well, the uh, gal, she was kind of my stepmom, took care of us a lot when we were kids. And so she was in Alabama, and I'd go back and forth and see her. She passed away this past December. We went by there to see their family, stopped to see some fraternity brothers, go mm -hmm. see some Marine Corps buddies, you know just hopping along, mm -hmm. you know, and taking a ride and visiting people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you when you get to be 80 years old, you know, you've got some regrets about things you've done, but you find out real quick that the most important thing in life is your friends. Mm -hmm. And your family is important, but eventually your parents are gone. Your siblings are scattered out. Your kids grow and they're gone. Yeah. And the only people that have stayed with you from the start to the finish are your lifelong friends. Mm -hmm. So, and the older you get, the more important that is because we find out now that this, we're the only ones left, you yeah. know. So we go by and we see these guys, you know, and they come see us. And so that makes it very, uh, uh, fulfilling, you know, to, mm -hmm. and this, my roommate from college uh, lives in Birmingham now, and he was in the Army, mm -hmm. Bronze Star recipient, and I go by and see him, and we sit and have a hamburger at his house and maybe drink a beer or not, and we just shoot the crap about nothing. It, we never talk about the military. Mm -hmm. You never talk about that because anybody that was there that's been in combat or in the, the veterans, you got that bond without even having to talk about it. Mm -hmm. You don't need to talk about it because we've all been there. So, But we just go and we just cherish each other's presence and because they're there, you know, we just reach out and hug each other. You know, and, and I found out that it's it's not sissified to hug your best buddy, you mm -hmm. know. I got a guy in Texas, in fact, he lives about 10 minutes from my daughter. And he and I were in the cradle roll at the church when we were infants. Mm -hmm. Went through school together. He was Army, and I went in the Navy. And, mm -hmm. But... Uh, we're still best buds today, and we're you know we're 80 years old. We've been yeah. our whole life together, and that's just sit down. So that's what's important, and some of those relationships that we made while we were in the service, mm -hmm. you know, serving in, in in Vietnam and even in the Marshall Islands, uh, are strong and as solid today as they were then. So that's what comes out of all of this is mm -hmm. the the camaraderie and the and the, the respect for each other and the love you have for each other and to cherish that and to hang on to that. I was joking here with one of your people when we talked about our veterans dinner yeah. that we go to and we talk about what our VA disability is. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's not, that's not a, a joke, that's a fact mm -hmm. that we're all disabled. Mm -hmm. And people look at us and say, we you mean you're disabled, but we got all our limbs, so, you know, you don't mm -hmm. talk about it much. But we've all got cancer. Mm -hmm. We've all got heart issues. So, you know, and it's just a matter of time. And and it's only in the last 10 years that the VA has even recognized Agent mm -hmm. Orange. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, every one of us that sit with, from our team, that are still talking, they're living to talk to each other. All got cancer. All got. I've had open heart surgery. Uh, my guy in California's had open heart surgery. Mm -hmm. 
you know, uh, arterial fibrillation, the other two. It's just, and they all goes back to Agent Orange. And, yeah. you know, it's we've been 53 years out of Vietnam. We're still paying the price. Mm -hmm. the, the sidebar here, I'll just throw this out, I mean, whether people realize it or mm -hmm. not. This Agent Orange uh, dilemma has only come out really strong in probably the last 10 or 15 years. And the VAs recognize it even more in depth than mm -hmm. the last 10 years. But let's back up to Sylvester Stallone's first Rambo movie. Mm -hmm. And I don't know whether you've watched that or yes. know anything about <laughs> it, but he was a Vietnam veteran coming down through the Pacific Northwest. Mm -hmm. And he was going by to see one of his team buddies, quote unquote, team, mm -hmm. you know, and he went to the guy's house and the guy's mother was there and Stallone as Rambo talked to his mother and she told him he had passed away from cancer just six months before or a year mm -hmm. before. And uh, and Stallone, of course, Rambo, Stallone took that, you know, uh, yeah, you know. Mm. So he goes on and they go through the whole movie where he's getting you know, chased and captured. And at the end of the day, the colonel comes in and pulls him out. And I've forgotten who played Colonel Troutman. But Rambo, he says, Colonel, he says, I'm the only one left. He said, they're all gone. He said, I just went to see Charlie and he just, he's passed away of cancer. Now that was in that movie. Mm -hmm. But nobody put two and two together. But that was Agent Orange mm -hmm. that got that guy. He died of cancer at that early age. And, you know, I didn't even think about that until now I've got cancer. Yeah. And they say, oh, man, was you in Vietnam? <laughs> oh, yeah. We don't, you know what Agent Orange is? <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. So but it was somebody had recognized something. Mm hmm back in at the during that movie and you know, mm -hmm. you didn't I didn't put it together until you know More recent afterwards mm -hmm. so the veterans today and and I mean oh, damn near everyone I'm in contact with is suffering from that yeah. it's not you know PTSD or you know we've got all our limbs but we're getting eaten up from the inside out yeah so that's why I'm telling you here earlier maybe I'll be here 10 months from now when this thing goes to <laughs> goes into the archives, I might not be. But it's one thing for sure that I've been to full circle. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm, uh, I wouldn't be disappointed if I kicked off right here. So, yeah. so it's been good. It's been a good life, and I I think uh, to to we gonna digress. I'm just keep talking. You're not asking me. You, you got anything you want to ask me? Um. Uh, I know we talked a little bit about um, you have a veteran dinner you're going to. You have the Zoom meetings um, right. with your veteran friends. Are you a part of any other veteran organizations such as VFW or American Legion or anything um, like I that? I am and I'm, and I'm not. Okay. Uh, the CBs, the, the uh, Navy CB Veterans of America, mm -hmm. major organization, probably got a million members across mm -hmm. the country. And they are set up in their islands or in their groups as islands. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you know this, but they're, they call them islands because the Seabees jumped across all the islands in the Pacific in the Second World War. Mm. So they named their chapters, if you will. They're called islands. I'm a member of Island 7, X7. Mm -hmm. It's in Wareham, and they meet at the VFW in Wareham, Onset, you know, ever whatever month or so. They're not very active. They don't do very much. Mm -hmm. We get more going at our veterans' dinner, like I'm going to tonight at mm -hmm. Rochester. The Senior Center in Rochester hosts this dinner the first Thursday of every month. Mm -hmm. And the VA rep from the Tri-Cities, which is Manaposet, Marion, and Rochester comes. Okay. And he brings people like your organization 
to the meeting and that's how I found out about you. So mm -hmm. we're in this group and we're passing things around and this VA rep is helping us a lot. But that, and then the battalion, MCB 11, they have a reunion mm -hmm. every year or so and I've been to one of those. Okay. But uh, I'm not really active if, if any of these veterans things except I go get this free meal every yeah. month. <laughs> <laughs> well deserved. Yeah. Well. It, what about the CB Museum in Kingston, Rhode Island? I've never been there, but have you? No. No, you haven't been there. No. Okay. You just hit a nerve, though. Did I? Yeah. What? Uh, the CB Museum mm -hmm. in California. California. Okay. Port Wyneme. Mm-hmm. U.S. Navy CB Museum. Mm-hmm. The Navy history and I'm trying to think of the exact name, Navy history and Commandant. Uh, there's a branch of the Navy that handles all the history and uh, historical archives and things, and they take care of all the museums. Mm -hmm. The only CB museum that's in under that command is the one in California. Really? Even though they have a great museum in Davisonville mm -hmm. and they have one in Gulfport. Mm -hmm. uh, my grandkids have been to the one in Davisonville. My daughter goes over there, and, but I've never been in there. Mm -hmm. And uh, the nerve that you hit on that is that we, we are four team members from Majuro Pass, mm -hmm. Marshall Islands, are in a head-on collision with the director of the CB Museum in California as mm -hmm. we speak. And we're soliciting help from the Navy and some different organizations to help try to help us get our foot in the door. Mm -hmm. I'll just share it with you real quick. While we were in Majuro, we retrieved a cannon mm -hmm. off the ocean floor okay. that was encrusted in coral and you know 40 feet of water and we salvaged it and brought it home mm -hmm. and then, and we dumped it off at the cb team training headquarters in port wanemi mm -hmm. 1970 now let's fast forward to 1923 last year when the team member that still lives in oxnard was at the museum and he sees this cannon laying in the dirt out behind the museum Oh. And he says, hmm, that looks like our cannon. Yeah. And one of the ladies that was working in the museum, there were volunteers, whatever, she said, you know about that cannon? He says, I think I do. She said, we've been wondering where that came from, what the story on it. So he told her, you know, we pulled it out of the lagoon and we brought it home and mm -hmm. we'd like to see it displayed. Mm -hmm. So we put together a, uh, an effort to have a carriage made for it, mm -hmm. research the history, where it came from. It's a British cannon from the 1812, 1820, wow. how it got to Majuro, and then the significance of the Seabees in the Pacific during the Second World War, and then the full go around to where we are now. And so forth so we thought it would be a nice display mm -hmm. and to tie the history of the CBs into the South Pacific into this cannon mm -hmm. and uh, the CB team the CB museum director told us to go fly a kite that there was no room for that she didn't want that cannon in her museum Wow! so she picked on the wrong four guys yep so <laughs> we got a couple of rear admirals and a captain helping us trying to get some Good. Some help to see if we can get this thing done. So yeah. that's another whole story, and that's and that is ongoing as we speak. Mm -hmm. So, well, I wish you the best of luck with doing that, and I hope that it does get on display. And yeah, well, we need know. to at least get it there once. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway. Absolutely. So, so, but yeah, that's uh, I've never been to the museum here. No, yeah, I haven't either. But after talking, and you know. I think I want to stop by and see some yeah, history on the CBs and yeah. yeah. Well, you know, CBs are a different breed of cat, and yeah. you've probably figured that out being mm -hmm. a fleet sailor. But uh, the uh, 
There's a story about in the Second World War when that MacArthur was going back ashore mm-hmm. and it, on the islands, and, and he's talking about what you know, the Marines and the Seabees were all there, and and uh, and somebody MacArthur asked one of the other guys. He says, "Well, how do I tell which ones are the Seabees and?" And which ones are the Marines? And they said, well, it's the Seabees are the ones with the cigars in their mouth, you know, so. Mm-hmm. And it's always been a story that the Seabees were there in front of the Marines because they opened up the beats and built the airstrip so that they could get in there. But that, of course, that wasn't totally true. Mm-hmm. But and, and then John Wayne did a movie about it, you know, the fighting Seabees and how all that came about. So uh, the fact is that I said in a couple of, fighting holes and was out on the trail with some Marines on in the same doing the same thing so uh, <laughs> you know I could say that uh, it was a very tight interface yeah so anyway the CBs were and in the Second World War they were all much older construction mm-hmm. guys and, and in fact it's a funny story uh, that the team is that uh, we went down to the Delta together. We had a builder on the team named, we called him Swede. He was from Sweden, Mm -hmm. of all places. He came to the U.S. through the Merchant Marine, and he learned how to speak English watching television on the ship. And when Vietnam got hot and heavy and, you know, they had an instant petty officer, you could join up, become a... uh, E4, you mm-hmm. know, just by signing up, it, well, he joined and ended up on the same team that I was on. So he and I were team buddies. But, and and this guy was, I don't know, he might have been about six feet tall. He's a pretty good sized guy. But he had this Swedish brogue, you know, so we, we're now down in the Delta and we are he and I are putting in a generator facility in a village up the river. Mm-hmm. And we had to pour a little concrete pad and put the generator. You know, it's like these generators you have out behind your house. But it was going to put some power in the village. So we'd get in a little boat and we'd put up there in, in the morning and go into the village and we'd work and piddle around and we'd come back. And off and on, we go up there. Mm-hmm. So we go up one day, and the VC are there, <laughs> and we're you know it's like a, you know, a wide herb at the OK Corral. You're looking at each other, and hmm, which one's gonna shoot first? Mm-hmm. And but the Swede had the radio, and they used these crazy call signs that would tongue tie the Vietnamese. Mm-hmm. Like we were fleecy torso, mm-hmm. and base was tipsy kettle. Mm-hmm. We well, the South Vietnamese couldn't say that mm-hmm. without giving themselves away because they had a knack of getting within the frequencies. And of course, we didn't have the technology we have today. Mm-hmm. Um, we had a prick twenty five radio on our back, and that thing was about as good as from here to the parking lot, you know. Mm-hmm. And that was it. But so Swede has a radio, and he gets on the radio and starts asking for some support help and uh, the base was coming back and s- figured it was BC was in the frequency and they told him well you okay get off the frequency VC you commie bastard dotty dotty da and of course the Swedish guy couldn't they trying to go tipsy kettle fleecy torso it took a while to get to the radio and well, Mac, what are you doing? I said, I need some goddamn help out here. <laughs> anyway, it was it was a funny. It wasn't funny at the time. Yeah, but looking back. When we got back, mm-hmm. and I told the LT, I says, I'm never going out again with Sweet if he's carrying a radio. Mm-hmm. We don't want him on the radio ever again. Yeah. So. We had some real interesting things. Uh, but you probably don't want to hear about any of that. So. Hey, we're all ears. We're all ears. <laughs> we are coming on a little bit of time. I do want to say thank you for sharing your story. If we, if we had 32 minutes yet. <laughs> <laughs> We've hit 
70 minutes. Oh, wow. <laughs> all, all amazing conversation though. And thank you so much for sharing and telling your story. Is there anything else that you want to hit on and let your other listeners know? Um, anything that you can think of about your, your service and maybe after service anything? Yeah, not really. Uh, you just you just want people to treat each other the way they want to be treated. Absolutely. You know, and keep the faith in the good Lord and and uh, red, white, and blue, mm -hmm. and 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 be thankful for what we have in this country. You know, all you got to do is step outside the borders, mm -hmm. and you will see. That, you know, that the gen and no offense, you know, well, you've been military, but the young generation today that they've never been without yep. and the instant communication gratification on this uh, you just you just want people to appreciate what they have and it's not free mm -hmm. you know you got to work for it work yep. ethic put your head down do your job don't worry about the other guy mm -hmm. you know keep the faith everything will be fine mm -hmm. that's the story and I'm sticking to it <laughs> love to hear it love to hear it <laughs> Uh, so thank you for your service and thank you for speaking to us today. Um, can't thank you enough. Yeah, just just the one thing, it just that some of the photos we were looking at, the kids, mm -hmm. the children in in uh, Vietnam, they were the victims of the old thing. Mm -hmm. You know, and and, yeah. and it was amazing that the Vietnamese lived off the American GI's waste. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know. We'd order up a pallet of mm -hmm. beer, not a case, but a pallet. Yeah. And we'd convoy up to get the beer and come back, and then you'd, eat, you'd drink the beer out of the cans, and you'd throw them into the trash. And you look around two weeks later, and the little Vietnamese guy down the street's got all these beer cans flattened out, mm -hmm. and he shingled the side of his house with these oh, flattened wow. out beer cans. Mm -hmm. uh, how about that? Yeah. They... Uh, they had nothing, and they lived off of the waste. The cardboard boxes that, you know, supplies would come in, mm -hmm. we'd throw them out. They'd put them up and make houses out of them, you know, decide the houses. So, mm -hmm. And the kids had absolutely zero, nothing. They'd get a bowl of rice a day, and that was it. No school, no, you know, they'd help out and work. And that's why these pictures, you see these kids are all around, because I got a sack full of candy. Yeah. And they loved that, you know. And the American GI in Europe did the same thing. They'd go through the, the towns and throw out chocolate bars, you know, for the kids. So mm -hmm. that was uh, that was probably one of the most rewarding things there ever was, is taking care of the kids. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you, we knew better, but they didn't. So. Mm -hmm. Anyway, just want to drop that in there. No, I'm glad that you did. Yeah, I'm glad that you kids did. were, they were, you just wanted to bring them all home with you, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all right, well, I'm done. I mean, <laughs> we could keep going there, but we're finished. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you so much for sharing everything and yeah. coming here and speaking to us and letting us document your story. Mm. And all right, more philosophical than factual, but. Uh, it was wonderful. It was wonderful. <laughs>